Everybody knew that this was unprecedented. No developed Western country had defaulted in any way on government debts. Basically, in the whole post-World War II era, this was an entirely new situation. In the pantheon of financial crises, this is mammoth. It's bigger than Russia in 1998. It's bigger than the Asian financial crisis. It has been a slow-moving train wreck. There was this sense in Europe that, oh no, the euro can't fall apart. Surely everyone will understand that if the euro dies, there will be a huge economic cost. Surely nobody wants to go back to the lira, the franc, the drachma. Hank Paulson, the former Treasury Secretary of the US, said that when there is a crisis, you have to take out the bazooka. That means act quickly, act decisively, and put a lot of money into the system. The Europeans did none of that. Europe is at the brink. Its economy faces a long recession, its people are restive, and the order that has brought peace to a once war-torn continent may yet come apart. In just two years, a government debt crisis that began here in Greece has infected all of Europe, and maybe soon, the world. Now the nations of the Eurozone face a stark choice. Repair the currency block at great cost, or dissolve the Euro and take a trip into the frightening unknown. United Europe was at its birth and remains at its heart an economic idea. Peace was its purpose, but economics the means. How do we avoid another World War I? How do we avoid another World War II? We bind nations together economically. We bind them together financially so that it is no longer in their self-interest to go to war. In March 1957, the Treaty of Rome was signed. In 1957, you had the European Economic Community, free movement of labor and goods. 1979 was the first experiment with a currency union by linking currency, European currencies, which then led to the European monetary system, which was the precursor to what we know and love today, the euro. And I think as, as important as individual European states, such as Germany and France, are as economic powers, the binding together of these could let them continue to be collectively true players on the world stage. By centuries end, the 15 members of the European Union had agreed on a common currency that most would share. They had achieved the economic integration that they'd spent 50 years building, brick by brick. At midnight tonight, we, the 300 million people of the Euro area, will all cross a symbolic bridge. The introduction to the euro, if we think back to it uh, at the time, was remarkably smooth from a logistical point of view. We Europeans just started using it, forgot about our national currency, and that worked. Initially, the euro slipped against the dollar, but by the end of 2003, it was above the price at its birth. For a while, the euro did very well, uh, partly held by the uh, weakness in the dollar. And I think a lot of us thought at the outset of the euro that there would be a united Europe. Once we, the euro was established, it seems like the big steps to get to that those next levels of cohesion never actually happened. What do we have in Europe? We have this Tower of Babel, we have this cacophony of voices, we have frictions between Germany and France and Italy. The so-called original sin of European monetary union was that they created a system where you have monetary union without fiscal union. The structure of the euro was such that you had to take fiscal discipline by the governments on faith because the European Union does not touch the fiscal sovereignty of government. So you would have a group of countries with widely diverging economic growth potential and frankly fiscal positions with one interest rate, one currency. The issue unfortunately was that uh, the uh, fiscal discipline wasn't there whereas the monetary discipline was. The thought was handing over monetary policy to the European Central Bank would go a long way in obviating the problems of the different fiscal regimes. It is a very, very tough monetary authority, which in the end put the screws on economic growth in Europe. That's where the seeds of the current problems were planted because countries like Greece and Italy were unable to grow as much as the others and, caused, and had therefore to resort to lax fiscal discipline in order to grow. Financial markets treated all Euro members pretty much the same, handing out loans to Greece on nearly the same terms as loans to Germany. Behind that grave error was a misplaced assumption that all the Euro countries were in it together, that none would let a fellow fail. That created a terrible problem, 
With borrowing costs low, there was no penalty for reckless spending. And uh, governments began to take on more and more debt. Greece took the most dangerous path. To make up for weak job creation in its private economy, it pumped up the public payroll. That meant more borrowing. How do you force a Greece or an Italy to behave in a way that they choose not to behave without causing some kind of schism within the Eurozone that would damage the collective? All of that kind of came to uh, a head in 2008.